the U.S. is in the middle of one of its longest periods of growth in modern history. And by all the usual metrics, the American economy is thriving. Just ask Donald Trump. The economic numbers just came out. They're very, very good. Our country's doing unbelievably well economically. Now, statistically speaking, he may be right. The unemployment rate is 3.8%. It's near the lowest we've seen in 50 years. Wages are rising. And after a drop-off in February, the country is back to adding around 200,000 jobs a month. But behind the banner headlines and record numbers is a more complicated picture of the American economy, where job opportunities are concentrated in big cities like New York, L.A., here in Boston, leaving entire regions behind and straining the infrastructure and resources on those centers of growth, sending housing prices and congestion to all-time highs. So what's the fix? My next guest argues it's science, but there's one powerful obstacle. I'm not denying climate change, but it could very well go back. You'd have to show me the scientists because they have a very big political agenda. If you have a windmill anywhere near your house, congratulations. Your house just went down 75% in value. And they say the noise causes cancer. Expanding science funding under an anti-science president? Economist Jonathan Gruber makes the case for going back to the future in his new book, Jumpstarting America, How Breakthrough Science Can Revive Economic Growth and the American Dream. It's co-authored by Simon Johnson. Uh, uh, Simon Johnson. John Gruber is also a professor of economics at MIT and one of the key architects of Romney Care and the Affordable Care Act. John, it's good to see you. Great to be here, So Jim. before I saw you laughing during Donald Trump's uh, uh, comments, before we start talking about jumpstarting the economy, let's discuss whether it needs jumpstarting. The most recent poll I saw, 71% said the economy was good, the highest number since Bill Clinton. So are those 71% wrong? Are they missing something? No, they're not wrong. I think there's two senses in which we should be worried. One sense is there's a lot of macro indicators that suggest a recession may be coming. Uh, The yield curve, the difference between the long-term and short-term interest rates, just went negative, which has predicted each of the last several major recessions. Uh, But more generally, the growth we've seen in America has just not been distributed fairly, which has been reflected in the in in recent elections. So you argue, you and your co-author argue, science, investment and R&D is the ticket. And you argue that it's not something new. We've done it before and it worked. Give us a little history. Sure. This is an amazing fact that not many people know, which is that in the wake of World War II, the U.S. made an enormous investment in public financing of research and development. By the mid-1960s, 2% of our entire economy, one in every $50, was government-funded research and development. Out of that came everything that makes the modern economy. Like what? Every part of your phone, satellites, digital computing, modern pharmaceuticals, all came out of investments that the government made. More importantly, the, the growing American middle class came out of those investments. That investment, those investments yielded job and economic growth. So if it was such a great idea and it was working, why did it end? Well, three reasons. First of all, the hubris of scientists. Scientists decided that science solved all our problems. They proposed a nuclear pen. Uh, we pen? A pen, a nuclear pen. They, they sort of ignored some of the hazards. Second was the scientists and the politicians found it easy to agree when it was wars, cold or hot. Mm. Once we got away from that, scientists and politicians started disagreeing. As we say in our book, uh, if you speak truth to power, power will cut your funding. And then uh, finally, we've run to some tighter budget constraints, which got in the way. You mentioned that 2% figure of GDP a couple of seconds ago. What's that figure now? 0.7%. 0.7%. So, yeah, we've third gone from about twice the high, uh, next highest country to 10th in the world. So if it's such a good idea, as you suggest, why isn't the private sector doing it? They like making money as far private as The private sector likes making money, but the private sector invests in research to the extent that it benefits their bottom line, not the extent that it benefits economic growth. And to point this out, we turn to one, I think, one of the most compelling examples in the book, which is the Human Genome Project. Okay, uh, in 1975, two economists won the Nobel Prize, two, mm-hmm. two scientists won the Nobel mm-hmm. Prize for, uh, for discovering the sequence of human DNA. One of them in the 1980s proposed setting up a company uh, to sequence the human genome. Nobel Prize winner who'd founded already another startup could not raise $10 million from the private sector. Why? Because no company could make money off sequencing the human genome. Instead, the federal government put $3 billion into what we call the Human Genome Project. Fast forward to today. The U.S. has a genomics industry which has created $1 trillion in economic value, 300,000 jobs, an average wage of $70,000 a job, all because of the government investment the private sector wouldn't make. Without which it wouldn't happen. Yeah, but the other thing, I want to talk about numbers in a second without giving people a headache. The other missing ingredient is not just a, a leader 
who believes in science, but an inspirational leader. You mentioned World War II. I assume this extended into the race to the moon with uh, John Kennedy, no? It, it did. It began in World War II. It then, it, it then re-picked up with Sputnik in 57, and then kept going with the race to the moon. The trick with the race to the moon was once we got there, the inspiration kind of fell off. You need to recognize the inspiration for science needs to come not just from a scientific goal, but recognizing it's central to economic growth. So how do you overcome a guy? I mean, while people laugh, you laughed, I laughed, these are serious positions held by the most powerful person in America. You are arguing for a dramatic increase in investment in science under a leader who time and again demonstrates he doesn't believe in science. First of all, you recognize there's enormous bipartisan support for science. Despite what our current president says, there's enormous support on both sides of the aisle for scientific leadership by America. Uh, people on both sides are frustrated. Second of all, that's why it's so important those scientific investments do not just go to Cambridge and to San Francisco, yeah. as they've done for decades. But you identify 102 country. communities, right? In, in our book, we identify 102 communities with highly educated populations, large urban centers, and reasonable cost of living that be can become tomorrow's technology hubs. And, and, and uh, uh, how much money are we talking about here? Well, we estimate, we don't know, there's no right answer, but we say in the book, for example, an investment of $100 billion would take us ba a year but to get us back to where we were in the early 1980s, and we say could create about 4 million new jobs. And let me do the math. Is that 25,000? 25,000 jobs. So that's a pretty cheap investment. You know, it sounds like a big number, but if you compare it to other investments, it's pretty so, cheap. So, you know, what, what generally what a politician uh, does when he says, well, we can't afford that, the if I say we can't afford that, even though I don't believe that, the response is we can't afford not to. You said a minute ago there's wide bipartisan belief that we need to invest more in science. What's the evidence uh, uh, of that? The evidence is... I mean, the Green New Deal, for example, is being ridiculed by at least 50 percent of Congress, plus a a decent number of even Democrats. You've just given your own evidence. The Green New Deal is being ridiculed, but what did Lamar Alexander, Republican senator, say? Yeah. I like the research part of the Green New Deal mm -hmm. is exactly what he said. There is support for research because there's evidence that research creates jobs and economic growth. And there's support at the local level. Localities want these investments. Okay, they want investments. They just don't want another bridge. They want investments that are going to grow their economies, and that's what this could but, do. But you know, it, it, the, the academic argument for this—I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I know it comes out in a pejorative <laughs> way. My, my, I did mean it in a pejorative yeah. way. I mean, you talk about World War II. There was a common cause. Right. You talk about the moonshot. There was a common cause. What is our common cause? I mean, you can make the case till you're blue in the face. I mean, when you were helping to make the case, uh, and the president was, on the Affordable Care Act, obviously people felt it directly because they were suffering. It's hard to make the case that because we're not investing in science, I'll make the causal connection. That's why you have a crappy job that's underpaid, and the coasts are doing great in some places, and the middle of the country isn't. How do you make the case without that one cause? Once again, the case has been made for us by Amazon. When they put out HQ2 to bid, 230 cities all across America desperately reach for those jobs. That's not the sign of an economy that's booming. That's the sign of cities recognizing that they are struggling to compete with the superstar cities on the coast. The case is that we're pulling apart as a country. And the way to bring us back together is to recognize that we need more investment to come off the coast and into the core of the country where possibilities exist. Yeah, we only have a minute or so left. Very, very quickly, here's what the uh, president, an economic matter unrelated to your book, here's what the president had to say uh, on Friday before leaving for the border about the Fed. I personally think uh, the Fed should drop rates. I think they really slowed us down. They should drop rates and they should get rid of quantitative tightening. You would see a, a rocket ship. Despite that, we're doing very well. We don't have time to discuss, you know, Mr. 999, Herman Cain, and Stephen Moore, who didn't pay his child support, his two nominees to fill, I guess, their seven seats on, on the Fed. But I have to say, as a non economist, there's some appeal to the notion that rates should be dropped and that will trickle out to all the rest of us. Is Donald Trump wrong here? Not necessarily. There, there's a really rigorous debate with the economics community about whether rates were raised too fast, uh, whether they should be dropped. But I think the important point is that it would not have the kind of dramatic effect on underlying growth that people see. We are in economics at a point of a permanently low interest rate environment. And the Fed moving the interest rate by a quarter of a point one way or another is not going to dramatically affect growth. If we want to really increase growth, we do so by investing in our future. I'll tell you, maybe if you supported Warren Kane, he'd support your science initiative. <laughs> it's great to see you, John. Good luck. The book's Thank terrific. You. The book again is Jumpstarting America, How Breakthrough Science Can Revive Economic Growth and the American Dream. And by the way, you can catch John and his co-author, Simon Johnson, 
at the Brattle Theater in Cambridge tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. For more information, head to harvard.com.